Hello, everyone. Welcome to um, another LSA CPD. Um, today, um, we're really lucky to have Tim Bell of Bell Phillips Architects. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, a later living scheme in Greenwich, for which uh, Bell Phillips have designed or produced uh, a number of schemes, and also elaborating on the HAPPI, the happy principles which were applied to that project. Uh, before I hand over to Tim, I just wanted to quickly say that if you put any questions in the chat, I will read them out or you can unmute yourself after the talk. And so the way the format of CPDs works is it's approximately 30 minutes for the talk and then around 30 minutes again for the discussion. Um, so yeah, please do ask away as I will be too. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Tim. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks Jason, can, uh, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you perfectly. Brilliant. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. Um, hopefully uh, this is a, a useful CPD. I can't see your faces, so I don't know what your reaction are, reactions are to this, but uh, maybe there's some chat at the end where we can pick up on some Q&A. I'm going to try and um, share the presentation. I've got uh, about 30 slides and hopefully this is about half an hour. Um, has that come onto full screen? It has. Looks good. Brilliant. I'll kick off. Um, so <clears throat> this is a scheme of bungalows for later living for Greenwich Council, social rented tenure, which we built on six different sites. Uh, and this was completed probably four years ago. Um, and the background is, I think Greenwich Council had two problems. They had lots of semi-derelict um, communal garage sites um, in their ownership. This is one of them. This is a backland site at the rear of um, one of their existing um, flatted blocks. But there were other garage sites that were sort of on street frontages. Um, and clearly these are, you know, pretty much disused. Modern cars are too big for the garages. Uh, they are expensive to maintain. They were doing nothing for the urban realm. They were an attraction to antisocial behavior. So clearly a problem. Um, so the council wanted to try and do something with this. At the same time, they had a problem with um, older people under occupying big family houses in their social stock. So maybe um, couples with families and children would have moved into those large houses um, in uh, previous years. Um, their children had grown up and left home and they're left rattling around in a four or five bed house and clearly the council has a desperate need for new family accommodation for families who, who need it. So they were trying to encourage some of these under-occupying older people to downsize to a new home. And from their research, the house topology that they, they decided they wanted was a bungalow, a two-bedroom bungalow, which would cater to the needs of, um, of older people um, and hopefully be um, an encouragement to sort of downsize. So, so that was the sort of two-pronged need uh, at the outset of the project. And that then developed into a brief from the council. As I say, they were looking for two bed, four person bungalows, for social rent. Uh, they wanted them to be adaptable to full wheelchair standards so that they were entirely, you know, um, habitable and usable for people if they were in a wheelchair um, later on in life uh, or, or with various other disabilities potentially. Um, had to comply with London Housing Design Guide, Lifetime Homes, Code for Sustainable Homes Level 4, uh, as it was then, not so much policy now, but um, that it was back then, secured by design, and the happy standards. So uh, maybe not everyone's uh, clear on the happy standards. So happy stands for Housing Our Aging Population Panel for Innovation, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, but it's... Um, it's a very good design guide that was first put together about 10 years ago, and it's gone through a few iterations since then. You can see the authors, um, HCLG, Department of Health, HCA, Design for Homes, and then two architectural practices, Levitt Bernstein and PTE, were involved in putting this together. So this is really aiming to improve the design quality of housing for older people. Um, and they, promote uh, best practice guidance um, and are a sort of source of information. And there's 10 key principles that they look for 
or that they recommend in designing for the third age. So uh, space and flexibility is a key one, but um, we can't, as designers, assume to know how people want to live. We need to leave that up to them and give them the opportunity and the space to make up their own decisions and give them the options in life to live the way that they want. So that's very key. Um, daylight is really important. I think probably on the point that a lot of older people may be retired, they may be spending more hours of the day at home than we are, although I suppose since COVID you could say that's um, slightly different, but uh, since we're all at home so much of the time, but the point is good daylight because you're at home so much is such an important attribute to mental well-being. But I think also we'd all agree that actually that's an essential attribute to any housing, not just for older people. Um, balconies and outdoor space um, is the requirement, sorry, um, and again, I think since COVID, we've all understood the, you know, the increasing importance of outdoor space, but certainly a key aspect of the happy guidance, that they should be adaptable and care ready. So whether or not they're designed for actual full wheelchair accessibility from the outset, they should uh, be adaptable to provide for that, should, they, should that be necessary. I think the next two points are maybe more relative or more, more relevant to um, extra care schemes or, or larger um, extra care type developments where there may be corridors and flats. Positive use of circulation, for example, you might expect there to be um, social spaces or informal meeting spaces and equally the shared facilities and the hubs. Uh, not so appropriate to individual house types, but um, certainly a key part of the happy principle. Trees planting in nature, essential in terms of um, well-being, mental health, um, ecology. Energy efficient and sustainable goes without saying these days. Good storage, very important for all of us. But again, a lot of people maybe who've gone through life and they, you know, you collect um, more and more belongings along your way. So you know, particularly for this age group, maybe more storage is a requirement. And um, the last point, uh, external shared surfaces and home zones, as much as possible, can there be streets which are livable, um, which do serve a social focus. So there are some of the key points. So as I say, two of them less applicable to single houses, but the rest of them we've hopefully achieved in the design of these homes. So here is London with Greenwich highlighted. There were actually eight sites at the outset. Two of them were flatted developments, which were um, atypical types but the other six were um, built out as the bungalow typology that I'm going to talk about. And um, I think a really important thing on this program was that we should develop a single house design that could be repeated on all six of these different sites, which is easier said than done because obviously each site is different. They, some, have, some are in Victorian streets, some are backlands, different scale homes and buildings around them. So, but nonetheless, it was important, I think, to ensure that it was financially viable, um, that the scheme should be a repeated type. It just wouldn't have been sensible to, to create a new, a new design in every instance. Um, I'm just gonna talk principally about one of those sites as, a, as a, an example in a little bit more detail. This one is Walnut Tree Road, and it's in um, just in the eastern edge of uh, Greenwich Town Centre um, on the way to Charlton. Um, this is a strange site where you can see outlined in red is, is a garage site. So there's two runs of garages. It sits in the corner of a street with gables from a terrace of houses uh, uh, at this point and a similar one running off north, actually north is to the right hand side of the page. I think this is probably a bomb site. I think originally there would have been the original street lines, Walnut Tree Road would have come all the way through Colomb Street and Tyler Street, but I think there was a bomb site. Uh, the houses on the edge and towards the left hand side of the image were, de were demolished. Um, a tree in the garden grew up. And much as the green space is good, I think the urban realm and the structure of the street pattern has been lost and is not very helpful. So, one of the things we were trying to achieve here is slightly bring back some logic to that street network. and. Demolishing the garages would allow us to actually open up again, at least a visual link along the original line of Walnut Tree Road, whilst thinking about building into the corner. 
So the next two images are existing photos of the actual site itself in this corner zone. The first one looks at the gable of that house to the right, um, and the second one to the other gable. So here it is, typical Victorian street of two-story houses. Um, on the right is the sort of entrance into the car park site. And this is the other gable uh, overlooking the site, which has been rendered and evidently there would have been a series of additional houses um, plugged on the end of these pre-war. Anyway, a largely derelict garage, garage site, just like the image I showed earlier on, um, with all the, the problems I mentioned to do with antisocial behaviour and really doing nothing for the urban realm. So the opportunities and constraints then, uh, just before we move on to the proposals, were that really, as I said, you, you could start to possibly open up that visual link along Walnut Tree Road, which hadn't existed for decades, um, reorganised a car park here, which much as we'd all like to do road car parks are a reality um, up to a point. And then the key opportunity for construction was in this corner. So linking up and stitching back together the junction between these two terraced streets. Um, so this was a, an early sketch that we did at design development stage and that we used in the resident engagement uh, pre-planning as we were talking to neighbours about proposals. Um, and it started to develop a house type which, and I'll show in plan in a moment, um, tries to uh, work with those happy principles, certainly of daylight so, and space. So this is actually not a two-story house, it's a single story bungalow, but with an almost double height space at the front uh, to give a really great generosity of volume and daylight. So a lot of these um, bungalows were built quite close to the street edge, some of them even closer, depending on the site, than this one. And the risk there, I suppose, is that if you build right up to the street edge, your front room suffers a potential lack of privacy in relation to people walking past in the street. So the idea here was that we might have only a modest size window at ground floor to get a visual glimpse of the street, to maintain some connection with the out, outside world, but actually the majority of your daylight comes in through this huge, generous, clearstory window at the upper level, um, which illuminates the whole of that double height space. Um, the living space sits in that main pitched up zone um, and the bedrooms sit in the lower portion to the side of it. And the other thing that that big pop-up dormer did is it started to give the bungalows a scale that was more appropriate to the context. So as I said, two-story houses, typically a single-story bungalow topology was never really going to feel right or hold its own uh, in terms of scale in that two-story context. So by pitching up these dormers, we start to achieve a frontage that has a relationship to the eaves heights of the existing two-story terraces. Um, so this was the resulting site plan uh, with the reorganized car park on Walnut Tree Road having demolished those bars of uh, garages and that uh, visual link through east to west. And in this case, we've got three houses on the site. Um, now, in terms of making best use of the site. Probably this brief doesn't do that. Uh, you, could, you could get more homes on the site if you, if you use a small flatted block topology or, or one bed flats, for example. But that wasn't actually the housing need and that wasn't what Greenwich Council needed. They needed bungalows. And so that was the, the brief in this instance. But three bungalows, uh, a small private rear garden at the back, a small uh, area of frontage, and the main body of the house in the middle. So if I flick to the next slide, I can talk through that in a bit more detail. So here's a plan and a section. That section is taken through the lower part of the plan there. So that lower part of the plan uh, is the living kitchen dining. So you enter from the street on the right hand side, a bit of defensible threshold and planting, a recessed porch, and the main entrance door enters straight into the front room. Um, there's a kitchen in the middle and there's a further living space at the back opening to the private garden. And one of the thoughts also in terms of flexibility and allowing people to live in the way that they want rather than being too prescriptive is that one person might be quite happy 
having uh, most of their hours spent in a front room overlooking the street. Another person might not, and they might prefer the privacy of the rear living space opening to the garden. Equally, since there are single typology on different sites with different orientations, in some sites, maybe the living space at the front is south facing, maybe in others, the space at the back is south facing. So depending on the orientation and your personal preference, privacy or openness, you could use these rooms for living and or dining, or you basically got the option of using a front or a rear room. Indeed, most people I assume would use both, but maybe for slightly different uses. And the kitchen in the middle, which is increasingly seen as the heart of the house, um, can um, service both. The, um, so, that, so that space at the front is the one that has the biggest volume. And you can see in section there the roof that pitches up towards the front, towards the street, and the space, which is almost double height. <coughs> Excuse me. The clerestory window there starts to give all that daylight that I mentioned from the hand sketch. And one of the other advantages is that in increasingly hot summers, you can achieve good natural cross ventilation securely by opening that clerestory, uh, which is well above ground level and is not accessible um, from passers by, and open the window or the door onto your private garden at the rear and you can get good cross ventilation all the way through that dual aspect space. So in terms of keeping cool securely, that, that works. Um, and also in terms of avoiding too much um, unwanted solar gain in the summer, this um, projection over the head of the clear story cuts out a degree of high angle sunlight in the summer and makes sure that the overheating is, is kept under control. Um, and also that recess starts to create a porch and a bit of cover when you arrive back home, trying to find your keys, putting the shopping down, it's raining, um, that uh, gives you a good threshold. The other part of the plan at the upper element is the bed spaces. There's a main bedroom at the rear overlooking the garden, which has the best privacy. Uh, and there's a secondary bedroom at the front. And I think, there was probably a question in Greenwich's mind about including the second bedroom in the brief because it very often wouldn't be necessary. But I think they were trying to really think ahead and I, I think it's great that they did. This bedroom could be used for so many different things and gives a really genuine flexibility for the future. It could be used as a home office or a work room for the people who live here. It could equally be used as a guest room if the grandchildren come to stay or indeed anyone. Uh, it could equally be used as a bedroom for a live-in carer, should that be required later in life. Um, all of those things are possible um, thanks to that second bedroom. And that bedroom sits on the street frontage, um, slightly less private, but it seemed appropriate that the main bedroom should be really private and the front room should have the flexibility um, to be used for different things. The bathroom in the middle of the plan uh, is entirely accessible and fully designed to wheelchair standards and there's a large storage area and all of that's accessed from a, an internal lobby which keeps that wing of the, of the home uh, slightly separate of the main living kitchen dining space which is very much open plan which also is quite an unusual typology for for a later living open plan is, is relatively new for a lot of people um, Space standards, if you were going to follow the London plan or the national technical standards, you'd be designing a two bed, four person flat at 70 square meters or even less if it's a two bed, three, which this effectively is actually. But this is actually 89 square meters. So I think, again, I think Greenwich should be applauded for, for being happy to build something quite a lot larger than the minimum standards. And it, it's due to those extra square meters that we're really able to achieve a lot of those attributes of flexibility and generosity. Um, and then this is uh, one of two CGI's uh, pre-planning that we produced and the end result came out looking pretty, pretty faithfully like this. Um, I think one of the things that, that didn't so much happen was planting. And I think there's some nice trees out here in the CGI, you'll see that they didn't actually happen in, in reality, which is a big disappointment. 
Um, equally, the railings at the frontage to give a little bit more um, privacy or notion, notion to the, the privacy to that frontage zone. Uh, but, you know, that's, I, I think increasingly, we need to try and ring fence budgets for landscaping in our projects. They, it always tends to be the first thing that gets cut out. So that's certainly a learning <clears throat> and an image at night. Um, I thought I'd just go through a couple of practical things. So obviously it's all very well designing um, an interesting looking house, but does it work? Is it, is it, it you know, can people live in it um, sensibly and clean it? This is a couple of diagrams from our um, operation and maintenance um, report, which talked about cleaning windows. So those at ground level, obviously you can easily clean them as a resident inside and out. But um, the upper level clear story was a question. And what we decided here is that every home would be supplied with a long arm squeegee. So people could still do that themselves from the inside and from the outside, um, just with a long arm, fairly light aluminium pole. Doesn't require the council to spend any maintenance budget coming to do it. It should be feasible for residents to do that in most instances, but um, certainly some might be more help with it, but that seemed to be a very practical solution. Uh, how to open those windows. Similarly, the clear story I mentioned, um, you can see in the elevation mark number one here, and again in the section, um, was openable via a winder. So at low level, at about 1100 above finished floor level with a winder, with just a very simple Teleflex cable system to an actuator. So not much to go wrong, no electrical installation, and a very easy thing for everybody to use and understand. Um, and similarly, there were some clear stories above the front entrance door and the um, second bedroom door, and they were both also operable via winders. Excuse me. And then the third <clears throat> drawing in that sequence is looking at maintenance and roof access. So the kind of butterfly roof section that we've got is also useful in terms of safe roof access which would be only carried out by um, Greenwich operatives uh, but it allows people to um, as you see at the bottom on the elevation use a couple of ladder restraint hooks put up a ladder securely and come up and climb up onto the valley gutter and then you can walk along the valley in absolute safety you can't fall off the edge of that the roof slopes down towards the, the valley and from that point, you can safely access the boiler flues, the vent pipe terminals, the PVs, <clears throat> and so on. Rainwater um, is gathered up by a rainwater pipe uh, dropping down through the valley in every house and also overflows on the end. We needed to think about trees. There are quite a few big trees, certainly on Walnut Tree Road, and leaf drop, and we didn't want them to be blocked. So there needed to be ample outlets and ample opportunity for cleaning. <clears throat> Excuse me. So two drawings about how it was built. So um, these are timber frame buildings, brick clad um, and zinc clad on top. And um, I, I think that that worked out well. Um, it, increasingly these days when we're thinking about embodied carbon, timber frame is obviously a great thing to use. Um, it was also good because it went up very quickly. It helped reduce the negative impact of the construction process on neighbors nearby because um, by having a panelized factory made system that just came in off the back of the truck and was erected in a fairly short space of time reduces any negative impact on people. Also the dead weight of, of a timber frame is fairly low. So the strip foundations were fairly shallow, which helps keep costs sensible. <coughs> and, um, the ground floor is a suspended beam and block. Um, the timber frame is lifted a couple of courses above ground to make sure that it stays away from the damp. Damp is obviously a sort of number one problem with timber frame, so we needed to raise it by a certain height, but equally then we needed to make sure we didn't suffer a cold bridge. So an inner level, an inner thickness of insulation on the inside of the stub frame helps us reduce any potential cold bridge through the block work. Um, and we also have a service so, zone here just behind the plasterboard, a 25 mil batten zone. So we can run any cables 
for the electrical back boxes and light switches in that zone without penetrating the insulation or the vapor control layer. And then on the outside, there's a OSB board um, with a breather paper um, and a cavity in the brickwork. So all of that's very standard construction. And again, something that um, the contractor was very happy to use and put together. <clears throat> and then this is the detail of the overhanging dormer roof edge. The majority of the, the roof was um, used a kind of steel web truss. And then this finer point projecting outwards, the, the gray hatch is a potential additional timber uh, joist that fixes to the tops of the um, metal web joists. You'll see in the photos in a moment that it, it was slightly different to that in reality, but very similar. And um, insulation on top with then the zinc profile, which you can, is barely perceptible here, that comes to a point and back down the underside. This is the high level openable window. Uh, another thing about the timber frame was making sure that we had enough movement and compression because obviously the timber frame settles by a few millimeters in relation to the brick on the outside. So the windows at the junction between the timber frame and the brick need to allow for a bit of compression to make sure that we don't induce any forces and cracks that we didn't want. So um, that was achieved there. So that was, um, that was the design in terms of how it went together. And it went together pretty much as planned. Um, this is a photograph of that front room looking up towards the clear story. I actually quite like it before it's been plasterboarded. It's um, quite nice when you can see the structure and the stud frames. It's all a bit more poetic than, than when it gets uh, lined out, but sadly can't stay like that. <clears throat> but you can see the metal web joists, the double stud um, frame in this case, because it was quite a tall span and with the OSB board on the back and then the mineral wool bats were fitted into the stud zone before having that additional layer of insulation and plasterboard on the inside. This is the um, breather paper going on top of the roof and the cheeks of the dormers, which looks a bit spaceshipy. Looks quite exciting here. Maybe we should have uh, specified something silver, but uh, anyway, it's quite interesting seeing this going up and becoming quite a, a monolithic um, silver uh, object. Uh, you can see the valley gutter there coming through and the rest of the breather paper wrapping the whole construction before the brickwork started coming up which it is here so actually walnut tree road is uh has a as a pale brick sorry um but we use diff two different bricks depending on the location uh, of the site so since there were six different sites some of them were in a context where there was um, a London stock brick, others were in a red brick context. So we just switched the bricks depending on which, uh, which was most appropriate for the context. So this was not walnut tree, this was a different one. <clears throat> uh, and then this is the profile of the, um, of the awning above the um, clearstory window. This is how they actually built it. So it was actually a nail plated, um, prefabricated element, a bit like you would, um, design or build a roof truss in a factory. And that was just brought in and wrapped across the opening. That was quite straightforward. And you see the insulation board going on here. And a similar view of, of the um, substructure coming up. Um, and then this is the finished result. So I think the, the zinc fabricator was excellent. I mean, the main contractor was very good as well. But I don't think we'd have got that sharpness of zinc at these junctions if we hadn't had a subcontractor that was uh, that was quite as skilled. Um, so that that came out really well. This is from VM Zinc, they're the supplier of this product. And they have a quite a nice range of different zinc finishes. And this is a kind of uh, terracotta brown, which seemed appropriate to the kind of clay brick context of most of these sites. Um, you can see the front door there with the uh, window panel adjacent, which gives you that glimpse view to the front room and the clear story. And the door on the side is to the second bedroom. 
but you can see the frustration of not having the tree or the railings. And I think another thing just to look out for something we've learned more about as we've gone through, um, especially design and build procurement, is to make sure that things like services and utilities are really well considered. <coughs> In an ideal world, pre-planning, looking back, we should have designed a cupboard into the jam here, into which you could conceal the gas and the electrics and the telecom intake. Um, but um, they ended up whacked on the front of the house where most of us would rather not see them. But I think, you know, that a cupboard next time round would have resolved that. Um, and you can start to see how the scale of the houses to the left um, relates to a degree to the pop-up dormers to the right. And inside, they really are quite full of light. So this is just coming in through the entrance door. This is the front room, looking through the kitchen in the middle, out towards the garden at the back. So it really is quite um, a long, spacious uh, volume, and the height is very unusual for um, a dwelling of this type. And looking back the other way from the living space, back out through the kitchen towards the entrance door, you really get the appreciation of that blistering window in the daylight in the front room. This actually was a different site again called Raven's Way in Lee, um, which was a backland site, which was very much more private. Um, it just had a yard at the front, which, which is quite a nice sort of uh, home zone area for, for residents and community life. Um, and this is the final slide. Um, some happy residents, hopefully they were all happy. We spoke to a few and I think Another thing I'd like to do more of is post-occupancy um, conversations and testing and analysis. But the anecdotal conversations we have with people were generally positive. You know, they'd never lived in a space which was as bright and spacious as these. So hopefully they, they've largely achieved their aim. Uh, and there we are. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very much, that, Tim. That was, that was super interesting. Um, just to remind everyone, if you want to put any questions, put it in the chat and get out, or you can unmute yourselves. Um, but I've got quite a few, so I'll kick off. Um, just, I think it's just regarding kind of that open plan space, really, and in particular with regards to later living schemes in which heating is usually quite a hot subject, pardon pun. Um, do you have any kind of stats on that? And particularly, is there like a, was there a heating strategy employed across all three houses? Do they share any heating or is it, I don't know? Um, so this was, well, no, so th this was co-sustainable homes level four, and mm. these were standard combi boilers uh, located in the storage cupboard off the corridor uh, with yeah. a flue that went directly up through the roof. And I think uh, partly Greenwich wanted a heating system that their maintenance people knew how to service and deal with. Mm -hmm. um, certainly these days you'd look to use an air source heat pump or some kind of communal system. But that, that's, you know, the sort of five well, more like seven years ago that we designed that. Oh, wow. Well, okay. yeah. Sure. Um, I can see a question from uh, Jules Campton. Um, did you have any problems getting the additional size and presumably cost past Greenwich's procurement team? I think just the political um, <clears throat> necessity and impetus was such that um, obviously cost is a key thing, but they were, they were quite happy to produce the right homes that they needed for, for, for the residents. And um, yeah, I think probably we were surprised too that the additional square meterage went through without too much trouble. There wasn't a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I'd like, I'd like to think that the fact that we designed them all as the same topology and tried to find as much standardization and economy of scale as possible helped the cost stay fairly modest overall. But certainly that additional square meterage um, wasn't a cheap thing, so it's great that the council were prepared to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to kind of the start of your presentation, you mentioned kind of the under occupation of um, other homes. Was there any kind of a spatial analysis that kind of went with that, or was it simply just beds not being used? If there was analysis, it's not something we were party to. I, no doubt the council did do all sorts of um, stats. Um, 
but yeah, I, I would like to know more about that, but it's not something that we were involved with. Sure, sure. And going towards the end of what you're talking about, um, how you, you mentioned some anecdotal stuff, but how are you finding people using the houses? Is it as intended, um, particularly like a flexi room, like, you know, obviously there's only three, but. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, I mean, we assume that the front, the front room would be a notional dining space and the yeah. back room would be a notional living space. That, those internal photos I showed at the end, that is how the, that particular resident ended up using it, the, the, the dining tables at the front. Um, and I think those that we've been to see have all used the main bedroom at the rear as, as their principal bedroom, which mm. I think we would all understand it's more, pri more private and secure. Um, so I think they've, they've mostly, from the few that we've seen post-occupation, that is, that is how they've ended up using them. Sure. And roughly, what is the age range of people that are occupying these houses? <clears throat> um, they, the brief was, I think, that over 55s, uh, which, okay. uh, which starts to feel not so old anymore. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, 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 so from 55 upwards. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of polemic in, in this sector about encouraging people before they get too old to be forced into a decision, to make decisions about life earlier on. Uh, we've done work for Pegasus Life as well, the retirement mm. home provider who did a scheme in Portishead near Bristol. And a lot of their research was interesting that they were trying to encourage people who are maybe in their 50s or 60s and absolutely you know, in the prime of life to make that decision then about where mm. they want to move to and why and making sure they had things in place for the later years. I think what, what we're trying to avoid is people having you know difficult events in their life that then forces them into making a back of the you know a decision on, on the back foot and you have to move to somewhere quickly because you, you, you know you need to so i think it's ideal if we can encourage people to make these decisions earlier on sure and kind of during the consultation for this project and indeed kind of the other later living projects you've mentioned what have been so far the kind of key takeaways which you've realized maybe for future projects or even for this, that you think, okay, right, we didn't know that, that's something we should definitely cater for. In terms of later living? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the flexibility is really key. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, whenever we, not just in these homes, but whenever we go back to see anyone in, in any of the developments that we've done, we increasingly realise that as architects, we're not we're not playing God. We don't we don't we can't assume to know how people live. We need to leave, leave people with all, all those options open for themselves. I think one other thing about open plan is, I talked about it here as a positive thing, and that's how we design these. But sometimes it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think again, probably a lot of us have appreciated in COVID times when there's more of us in a household, and someone's clattering around in the kitchen and someone else is trying to watch a film or do some work actually some subdivision of living spaces is quite useful um so obviously didn't achieve it here but i would say actually that's something i might do different next time mm -hmm. um sophia asked a question which i was actually meant to ask myself but got distracted and other questions um uh they say thank you for the presentation do you have um, information on energy usage yet Yes, we do. Uh, I could have put some in and I can't think off the top of my head where we got to on that. So I can't give you a clear answer, but um, it would be fairly low because there was quite a good degree of insulation in those uh, walls and roofs. I mean, the walls had 140 of mineral wall plus at least 50 of um, Kingspan. Um, mm -hmm. They have probably got a U value of sort of 0 0.15, 0 0.16 and they're quite airtight again, being timber framed. So another advantage you know being a factory made precision made panel you, it's, you know very tight tolerances they come in they get fixed together the paper control layers get taped up so the um the air tightness of that construction method is quite good too so i can't get absolute figures but i would hope that they're, they're pretty good sure um also in your presentation you mentioned um the key opportunity for construction was that something prescribed by you or the council the you mean the, the decision on how to build them? Uh, yeah, and the, you outlined a, an area, I believe, in, in Red Light Coat, and you said that was the, the kind of key opportunity area for construction or where you want oh, to see. Yeah, on the opportunities and strengths plan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, on the site plan. Uh, well, it just seemed logical in that particular site to try and open up the original street line rather than mm -hmm. building across it. 
um, in terms of legibility of the urban realm and visibility yeah. and sort of personal safety and sight lines, it seemed logical to do that, which then left us with the corner between the two terraces where there would originally have been some houses. So uh, that one almost designed itself in terms of site plan. Yeah, uh, yes. Obvious when you point it out again. <coughs> um, you mentioned also at the start kind of uh, I think five other schemes which are kind of happening around Greenwich from you. Uh, could you elaborate on how this ties in with those? Yeah, so, so I mean, they were all of the same house type. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the smallest one was two homes and the largest was six. Mm -hmm. The one I just showed you was three. Um, and I think uh, most of them were in sort of terrace street context. Uh, two were backland sites behind apartment blocks of kind of three stories. Some were quite heavily overlooked. Some had windows uh, with rights of light and daylight mm -hmm. and sunlight requirements right on them. So again, the low scale of the bungalows worked quite well for that. Um, and also some of those backland sites, suddenly if you create a, a terrace of homes in a backland site overlooking the residual area of the courtyard, it becomes much safer and overlooked and inhabited and it's no longer a no-go zone it's it's actually uh, it's, it's you know it's a, it's a community so um so some of those are that they were quite good actually the two backland sites in, in that respect sure sure i mean were they were these all built around the same time or did one yeah they were all built at the same time and okay. that, that's another thing they were all built by the same contractor which i think was great we've done yeah. another multiple infill scheme for another borough in london um, with a single house topology on several different sites. But for whatever reason, they used different contractors <clears throat> to build out that same house type on different sites. And I think that maybe wasn't their original intention. It, it, various things got in the way and maybe the programs were, were, were not coherent. But that turned out being much more painful, uh, probably much more expensive because there wasn't the economy of scale in terms of material supply or the, the contractor sort of learning from one to the next. So this one was good. All six were largely built to the same, but slightly staggered program. So the first site was built uh, or started, you know, construction in the foundations and the superstructure. And then the next one kicked off and there was a kind of learning process. So probably the first one was, was used almost as a test bed to flush out any tricky little problems that could then be used as learnings on the subsequent schemes to help them run more smoothly. Sure, sure. And so in terms of kind of getting the contractor so well on board and single state <coughs> sheet, um, was there, what was your kind of process in engaging them? How early did you get them on into the scheme? Was it earlier than usual or was that the, the contractor? Yeah, yeah. No, this was a really traditional single stage DMB. Yeah. So we went to planning on work stage three information uh, and the borough did a single stage DMB tender. Uh, on that basis and then we were not formally innovated but uh, the consultant switch and we were mm -hmm. taken on by the contractor to work through the technical design um, i think you yeah, know i think we'd all like to see more joined up thinking and partnering where contractors are involved earlier on um, and are more part of that collaborative conversation um, to, to resolve all sorts of details from from the first steps mm. and this is kind of an odd question but what is kind of the expected occupancy time of these houses <clears throat> yeah tricky i don't know i mean we were asked in our brief to design for the standard 60-year lifespan uh, uh -huh. in terms of the buildings uh i don't know <laughs> i mean i ask because like do at what point do you start to factor in um providers of care into these schemes that may be entering the building or living in obviously you've got that flexible room which might very much caters to that but i was curious if that was in your brief or yeah, That's no, it wasn't. Funny. It wasn't uh, specified. It wasn't stated in the brief. But yeah, I, we we would hope that, and it was part of our, you know, the client's requirement that yeah, this should be a home for life. That people mm. should be able to stay for as long as 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 um, mm -hmm. as they can. And and that second bedroom does allow for a, you know someone could buy in a care package, mm -hmm. or the council could provide a care package via um, an individual who might be. Yeah visiting or a live-in carer but all, all that's possible yeah and i was also kind of uh, interested in your approach to making maintenance as kind of easy as possible you mentioned with the windows i was wondering if you could elaborate on any other uh, strategies that were in place to ensure that 
simple maintenance. I mean, I think um, a brick cladding, I mean, brick is just the, yeah, yeah. the standard material these days, or has been for centuries, but it, clearly it's very robust and doesn't really need much in the way of maintenance. Um, and the zinc doesn't either. It, mm -hmm. it won't rust or corrode or anything. So the outside should require nothing. Um, inside, I mean, really nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, probably kitchens and bathrooms need replacing every couple of decades. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously boilers need annual inspections. Um, but there's nothing unusual in, in there. I mean, I, even the timber frame, some people might query the longevity. I think if it's detailed properly, kept out, kept out of the damp, no roof mm -hmm. leaks, then the timber frame should be absolutely zero maintenance and, and last indefinitely. Sure. Um, you've answered my questions very succinctly and very quickly, which is always super useful, and I think everyone would appreciate that. Um, so that I've got none left, but if, if anyone else um, has any others, feel free to put them in, but um, always happy to kind of keep, keep the conversation going with the offline as well. Um, and that's why the, the whole point of the CBD is to, to allow for this as well. Um, but if anyone else has any others, do put them in. One of the reasons I want to outline to, I wanted to have this conversation is because we're running a design think tank at the LSA, um, which is about, this is not the title, but it's about, set of, it's about um, living and dying in the city and celebrating life and death. And sometimes death can be quite a hard subject to approach, but it's, you know, as designers, we're gonna have to be designing for lots, an, elderly, an, an aging population um, much more. And um, I was really fascinated by your work in Greenwich and how that would potentially feed into that. Hopefully this CPD will be of use to those students. Um, so that's what, that's what's going to outline why I've got, I can see another question come in then I'll read it out before, before we end. Um, hi there. Could you expand on the offsite panels? Very, very specific question. Um, yeah, I can't think of who the supplier of the panels was. Uh, maybe I should just share a photograph again of them. Hold on a sec. Um, if I can just flick back, is this going to work? Yeah. No, this is probably the best one, but um, they were they were two dimensional panels. <clears throat> so on the right hand side, that was a a full wall panel. I think the whole of the party wall front to back was probably made of two or three panels to make them manageable on a truck. Um, but they would have been made in the fabricators' workshop. They were probably made by someone like Kingspan Potton or or someone like that. Um, <clears throat> and they're very simple. I mean. They're just probably made on the jig. They've got OSB board, 90 mil on the outside face, which is nailed into softwood studs at 450 or 600 centers. Um, as I said, there are double studs here due to the span. Uh, but I think you can see on the left-hand side there, that front wall panel, which includes the opening for the clear street and the front entrance door. is a single stud with a um, <clears throat> lintel beam across the top. That would have all been one panel. Um, and then the roofs came in um, in cassettes. I think they were a whole panel themselves. Uh, I, or maybe they came as separate joists. I can't remember, but I think they were panelized. So, you know, they, these things go up in a matter of days. They're really quick. Um, mm -hmm. A bit like uh, CLT, you know, they, they're still 2D panels and they, they come up and you have a strut that holds a wall panel in place before you then add the others to rigidify it before you add on the roof. Um, so, as I said, quite tight tolerances, and it all went together pretty in a pretty straightforward way. Sure. I also can. Sorry, Carl. I can elaborate more if there was a specific query about it. Uh, well, I'll give GH, GHA London Ballroom a chance <coughs> to get okay. it. They, they can unmute themselves if you know, they so like. Anyway, I was going to ask as well, um, as it came into my head. Obviously, you lost that bit of pavement there. I mean, that's usually quite a hot topic of conversation with councils sometimes like what are, what were you um how would you how do you wrangle that one essentially well a bit of pavement around here uh yes where is it yeah 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 um was that was I that a non-issue it was a non-issue and it helped i suppose that our 
client was the council um, in that a lot of, actually, I think the whole of the red line, red line site was owned by Greenwich Housing Department, but if there'd been other areas that were owned by Greenwich Highways Department, mm. it, it, we could have had a conversation about the land transfer, um, which <clears throat> might not have been so straightforward if the client had been a private developer. Mm -hmm. um, we often find that in our public sector work that, that there's a conversation that we can have. Sure. Um, and, and in terms of the wider area as well, like, you know, how did Howard Greenwich, maybe you don't know the answers, but Howard Greenwich outlined this as a suitable site for a later living scheme or indeed the, the other five sites? Yeah, well, actually, what I missed out was that at the outs, even before this process, we did a feasibility study on lots of different sites. I yeah. should have mentioned that. We did a, probably about, we looked at about 25 sites for the council where they'd sort of probably spoken to their garage department and said, you know, where have you got garage sites which are not providing any revenue or causing trouble? Uh, that went to the housing department. The housing department put together a brief and said, said to us, can we you know, look at these 25 sites? And we just did a really high level study looking at that, um, putting down footprints for, for a house type. Um, and looking also at um, <coughs> excuse me, any other opportunity constraints that, that would help decide whether or not these sites were developable. You know, is there a substation in the way that was going to be expensive to move? Mm -hmm. Is there an overhead pylon? Is there a trunk sewer running underneath? Um, is there a category A tree um, in the middle of it? All of these things. And uh, then we, with the council, looked at our feasibility study and said, well, actually, discount site XYZ because of these expensive, difficult issues, but the most deliverable sites are this, this, and this. And then they became uh, the sites that we actually worked into. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, thank you for that. Um, well, I think it's uh, eight minutes towards two, which is pretty good timing. Um, we can probably wrap, wrap up there. Um, if anyone has any questions, pop them over to me. I can potentially ask Tim if he's really nice, he might answer them. <laughs> uh, uh, coming up next week, we have Elena Hill of Party, who will be talking about um, self-starting a research-based practice straight from graduation and you know, the collaborative practice they employed to make that happen. So that should be really interesting. But until now, uh, I want to say thank you to those who joined for the questions, but a big thank you to Tim for a really enlightening talk on those schemes in Greenwich. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. See you all soon.